This is KGW-TV, Channel 8, Portland. This is News 8 at 5, where news and information come first. Reported by Casey Cowan, meteorologist Jack Capel, and Joe Becker with sports. And now, News 8 at 5. Good afternoon. Hurricane Elena gained more strength today. Its winds now pack a 125-mile-an-hour wallop. After menacing the Gulf Coast for two days, the storm has turned to the northwest, threatening Florida's panhandle. Dennis Murphy has details. Elena retreated from Tampa Bay today, but it hadn't gone away. The governor ordered out 3,000 National Guardsmen to keep people from returning to their homes. But many people who woke up to only gusting winds packed their bags and left the safety of their emergency shelter. The 800 homes without power for a while. In the Tampa Bay area, a quarter of a million residents spent most of the weekend in crowded shelters. By this morning, food was running low. The Red Cross called for emergency deliveries. The evacuees wanted out. It's nice that we just, you just can't sleep. But... I'm trying to make myself happy and make the best of it. Outside the shelters, trees had been blown down. So had power lines. 100,000 customers in the Tampa Bay area were without electricity. Boats sank, and streets along the beachfront were flooded. This was high tide today at St. Petersburg Beach. The hurricane has caused extensive erosion of sand. Some beach houses have been damaged. I haven't got the authorization to let you in. The governor says his greatest fear is that people will go home too early, thinking the storm has passed. Dennis Murphy, NBC News, St. Petersburg, Florida. And Jack Powell will have more on the hurricane in his weather segment. The co-chairman of Portland's Black United Front says there will be a federal investigation of a shooting incident last month. 86-year-old Roberta Tate and 37-year-old Thomas Graves were shot to death by police during a standoff at their northeast Portland home. Graves, a former mental patient, was holding his landlady, Mrs. Tate, inside the house. According to Ron Herndon, the Justice Department has directed the FBI to look into the matter. Herndon requested the investigation after Portland authorities decided not to hold a public inquest. Herndon was not told how long the federal probe will take or whether the results will be made public. Police arrested a state penitentiary steward today on charges of supplying marijuana to prison inmates. 52-year-old John Weiss, who supervises inmates doing meal preparation, was arrested as he came to work. Police say he had an unspecified amount of pot on him at the time. Weiss was taken to Marion County Jail. Well, unless you remembered that fares were going up, you may have had a surprise if you got on a TriMet bus today. The first fare increase of three years went into effect today. Adult fares went up 10 cents. Now, for a one or two zone ticket, it will cost you 85 cents, a dollar 10 for a three zone travel, and a dollar 35 for an all zone ticket. Also increased the Youth Pass Plus. It will go up $5 to $20, and youth discount and cash fares will be eliminated. Meanwhile, labor negotiations between TriMet bus drivers and management are set to resume on Tuesday after the holiday. And TriMet officials say that the light rail construction project is on target. Today, a major thoroughfare in downtown Portland was reopened. News 8's Paul Hansen has more. They were sweeping up the mess early Sunday morning. But few were on hand for the big event. No parades, no free balloons for kids, no politicians to cut ribbons. In fact, there was no fanfare of any kind. But an important event occurred today, here, in the transit zone. The automobile, the symbol of mobility and status or lack of same, returned to the transit zone as Southwest Yamhill was reopened between Broadway and 10th. They came slowly, cautiously, some look confused. In the transit zone, you get used to streets being closed, not open. But light rail construction is on target, and soon other streets will return to normal. Mark Turner is in charge of cleaning sidewalks. He explains what's next. Broadway and Yamhill down to 1st Street, hopefully within two weeks. And then uh, what's after that? Uh, Northwest Davis on 1st Avenue up to Yamhill. And how long will all the be, before all those streets are open what, what are we looking at I am told November 15th we will have all of them done cleaned up and open ready for the public the reopening of Yam Hill is good news for businesses in the transit zone which have suffered since light rail construction began here earlier this year TriMet officials say things will get better from now on in the transit zone Paul Hansen News 8 
A tanker truck carrying 11,000 gallons of gasoline exploded today near Reedsport. Oregon State Police say the truck hit a guardrail around noon and then burst into flames. Both lanes of Highway 38 have been closed to all traffic. Cleanup crews are trying to remove the truck from the road at this hour and reopen that highway. There's no word yet if there were any injuries. Still ahead on News 8, we'll update the forest fire situation in Oregon and Washington. Plus, the Oregon Symphony is making beautiful music once again. The South, a excuse me, the South African government announced today that it won't repay its foreign debt for the next four months. The country also introduced new exchange controls. Finance ministers said that the measures were taken because foreign banks are calling in South Africa's loans and the country now faces a cash flow problem. <clears throat> the space shuttles Excuse me, astronauts finished their fix-it work today some 225 miles above the Earth. They repaired a 15,000-pound satellite and then shoved it back into space. The repair job saved insurance companies about $63 million. With their task accomplished, the astronauts will head back to Earth, landing on Tuesday. Locally, a fire broke out along the southern Pacific tracks in Canby this afternoon, burning some grass and brush and some railroad ties. It threatened a trestle near Canby, but firefighters and crews from southern Pacific were able to control the fire before it did any major damage. And elsewhere around the state, Oregon firefighters are getting a much-needed rest thanks to cooler weather and some rainfall. All fires that were burning in Oregon are now either out or under control. But that's not the case in Washington state. The big blazes there are still out of control. Cooler weather has helped some, and firefighters are making progress. But still, over 2,000 state and federal firefighters are working on the Barker Mountain Fire that has destroyed 25,000 acres and 19 homes. 50% of that fire has been contained, but the steep terrain is making it difficult to control. It's an issue that has surfaced and resurfaced in the Portland City Council, and it's about to make another comeback this week. It concerns the sale of fortified wine in Old Town. Merchants there have long been in favor of banning the sale of wine as a way to cut down on crime in the area. Two merchants today painted the sidewalk in front of their stores to call attention to the problem and gain support for a resolution that goes before the council this Wednesday. It calls for a test ban on the sale of fortified wine in Old Town to see if crime is reduced. Right now, the area has one of the highest rates of violent crime in the city. Merchants and the Portland police attribute the statistics to the high numbers of alcoholics who make the streets their home. I see murders. I see assaults. I see robberies on the streets, and it's a daily occurrence. I see a police department that doesn't have the ordinances or the jail space to take care of the problem. So what I say is to let's try a test, let's see if it works, see the results, and then make a decision. Merchants say they will be out in full force to testify in favor of a test ban at Wednesday's council meeting. The new director of the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry says she believes it's time for the museum to grow. Marilyn Eichinger was founder and director of the Impression 5 Science Center in Lansing, Michigan, before taking the job as OMSI's new director. I'm hoping that it's in, in the future that we can develop a new facility, a larger facility, that will enable us not only to bring in traveling exhibits as we're doing now, but to maintain some of the science exhibits that are the uh, heart of a science museum. And unfortunately, OMSI always has to empty out the regular exhibits in order to make room for the special events. Eichinger says that OMSI may need an additional 20,000 feet of exhibit space. She thinks the museum might be able to attract national funding if it can become a recognized science facility throughout the United States. Eichinger will take over as OMSI director on September 9th. This is the last weekend, by the way, for the Muppet exhibit at OMSI. It closes Monday, and it's been drawing record crowds all summer. And also today, 20 years of history came to a close. The Ladybug Theater at Washington Park Zoo held its final performance this afternoon. It was in May that zoo officials told the managers of the Children's Theater that the structure was to be torn down to make way for the zoo's new entrance, all part of a master plan. Although the zoo tried to find a new home for the Ladybug Troupe, it could only offer temporary space. So the company will pack up and move out of the zoo. Managers say several ideas are in the works, and they hope to announce a new home for the theater by the end of the month. Well, Portland Schnitzer Concert Hall was filled with the sounds of the Oregon Symphony this morning. It was the first rehearsal following a 15-day labor dispute between the Musicians' Union and the Symphony Association. Both sides reached a contract settlement on Friday. Included in the three-year contract is a 3.5% pay hike for the musicians the first year, as well as gains in medical benefits for musicians and their families. Concessions on the part of the union included more Saturday rehearsals to allow for a more varied program schedule. 
The Oregon Symphony will start off its new season with the annual Waterfront Classics concert this Tuesday at Tom McCall Waterfront Park. The concert is free. <laughs> to. It may have sprinkled a little bit today, but Jack Capel says it's still probably safe to plan that Labor Day picnic. Weather is next. Driving to work this afternoon, just a few sprinkles. A few sprinkles, but on there my were a few, few more sprinkles to the south of us. Most of it occurred in southwestern Oregon. There's also a few uh, showers reported east of the Cascades in Oregon and some in eastern Washington, but uh, from Portland on northward, there wasn't very much. Not uh, a lot. But tomorrow, we expect they'll be pretty well gone. We see some partial clearing. While the big weather story continues to be the hurricane, we have a satellite picture of Hurricane Elena, uh, which is in the Gulf of Mexico. It has uh, intensified a little bit since yesterday. Peak winds now up to 125 miles an hour. The sto storm has been slowly moving toward the west. That means that there's less of a threat to the west coast of Florida, except in the panhandle. The center of the storm now is about 40 miles southwest of Apalachicola, Florida, and still seems to be edging very slowly to the west, and still there's no indication as to just exactly where it will move on shore. The warning area has been extended further west to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and has been moved northward along the Florida coast and uh, begins at Yankeetown. And the storm uh, eventually will move on shore somewhere in the Gulf Coast, and that means that in that area, tides should be about 10 to 12 feet above normal near the center of the storm. Rainfall amounts over 10 inches expected over portions of northern Florida, and there is a chance that New Orleans may be in the warning area if that storm continues to move just a little bit further toward the west. Well, our satellite picture over the northwest shows a streak of clouds, uh, mostly from southwestern Oregon up through eastern Washington. That's associated with the upper air disturbance we talked about yesterday. On the wider view of the satellite picture, we see where the high and low pressure areas are centered, and there is a big high pressure area out to the west of us, and gradually that should be pushing in over us tomorrow, and the disturbance should be passing on toward the east. We see also on the surface map the high pressure area out to the west, and lower pressure east of the Cascades. That's bringing some west winds now through the Columbia River Gorge. Yesterday was very little. Now we have west winds through there once again, and some northerly winds along the coast. Not very strong northwest along the uh, northwestern portion of Washington. Again, not very strong. Uh, the only winds of any consequence are in the gorge itself. Upper air pattern shows that there is uh, high pressure out to the west, but there's our trough of low pressure uh, streaking right through the northwest, and the jet stream or uh, the upper flow uh, dipping south around the trough, coming back up to the north again, and that trough of low pressure gradually moving a little bit further toward the east. And as it does so, we should see clearing weather. Temperatures at mid-afternoon around Oregon and Washington today, 72 at Portland Airport, also at uh, Boeing Field in Seattle, and east of the Cascades, some cool spots. Redmond getting some rain late this afternoon, 57, and there was about a tenth of an inch of rain in many parts of southwestern Oregon. Medford had 1,200s. Also, rain occurred along the coast from about Newport south, but again, amounts mostly less than a tenth of an inch. Lows this morning. Uh, the low this morning in Portland Airport, 59 degrees down to 52 at Salem and in Central Oregon, Redmond, 38, and in the 40s in some areas along the coast. Temperature right now here in downtown Portland is 68 degrees, and uh, the barometer holding just about steady at the present time. Uh, the satellite picture across the nation uh, shows mainly that uh, storm area associated with Hurricane Elena in the Gulf of Mexico, that line you see across the bottom part of the map there is an extraneous line. Uh, the uh, temperatures around the nation today, uh, you'll notice quite a bit of cooling in the Central Plains area, 83 at North Platte, Nebraska at mid-afternoon. That's down from a temperature of near 100 yesterday. Los Angeles is a bit cooler. Downtown, they were 88 this afternoon. Yesterday, they were in the upper 90s. In Alaska and Hawaii, temperatures holding in the mid-50s in most areas, 38 at uh, Point Barrow on the Arctic coast, however. And for the forecast for the Oregon coast, uh, first of all, some morning cloudiness. They may have a sprinkler or two yet there tonight. And then becoming mostly sunny in the afternoons tomorrow and again on Tuesday. And for uh, the Cascades, we can look for mostly sunny weather there. Also, they still will have some showers scattered around tonight, a rising freezing level there tomorrow. And for central Oregon, uh, some scattered showers uh, here and there tonight. And then uh, tomorrow and Monday, back into sunny weather and temperatures in the 70s. And for the Portland and Vancouver area and the Willamette Valley, still a chance of a sprinkle or two tonight. And then becoming mostly sunny tomorrow and on Tuesday. And temperatures rising up into the mid-70s. A little bit upper, warmer. Upper 70s, a little right. bit warmer. Good. Thanks a lot, Jack. Coming up, Pete Rose is chasing Ty Cobb's ghost. Joe Becker has that. Plus, fans are chasing souvenirs. Sports is next. 
Go back and joins us now. Good day for Pete Rose. Two more hits. That's uh, right. Two more hits today, and the record could fall this week. Pete Rose now just six hits away from breaking Ty Cobb's all-time hit record. Rose two for four today. He keyed a three-run eighth inning for the Reds. Cincinnati beat Pittsburgh three to two. The Reds now headed for St. Louis in a three-game series with the Cardinals. Rose will probably play in all three games. Meanwhile, the Cardinals' Willie McGee raised his batting average to 367 today with three hits, including a solo homer in the bottom of the fifth as the Cards beat Houston. The homer came off starter and loser Joe Necro of the Astros. McGee, having a fabulous year for the Cardinals, called out of the dugout by the Cardinal fans at Bush Stadium. St. Louis trying to fatten their lead in the NL East Division. Ha, ha. Another good pitching performance for St. Louis left-hander John Tudor. Here he fans Necro who lets his bat fly into his own dugout. Slipped right out of his hands. Two to win all the way for St. Louis. Pitching his 10th complete game. He's now 16-8 and eight on the season. He leads the league with seven shutouts. The Cardinals win it 5-0. Meanwhile, the Mets beat San Francisco, so the Cardinals two games up on New York in the NL East race. As I mentioned, the Reds win today. The Cubs bombed Atlanta 15-2. Philadelphia sweeps Los Angeles. Four straight, it was 4-1 to today. And Montreal lost to San Diego 5-1. In the American League, the Yankees still trying to catch the Blue Jays in the American League East. Yankees in California today. Top of the first, Joe Cauley throws inside to Rob Wilfong. The ball rolls back to the backstop. Catcher Ron Hassey thought it hit the batter and doesn't chase it. However, it hit Wilfong. Two runs score in the play, and it was 3-0 California. Then came another hair-raising experience. <laughs> Bottom of the fifth, Willie Randolph with a foul ball down the right field line. Rupert Jones goes into the stands. And the fans ignore Rupert and make every effort to get the souvenir. Jones is lost in the excitement. Finally, someone finds the ball, but not Rupert. Yankees finally find the winning touch. Don Mattingly with a pair of homers, leading New York to a come-from-behind 5-3 win. Elsewhere in the American League, Chicago whipped Toronto 4-1. The Jays lead the Yankees by only four games in the AL East. The Tigers did a number on the A's this afternoon. Seattle bombed Baltimore. Boston ripped the trend. Twins. Cleveland did the same to Milwaukee. People still talking about the Ducks season opener last night. A thrilling three-point win over the Cougars at Pullman, Oregon beat Washington State 42 to 39. Now a number of outstanding performance for the Ducks last night. Both Chris Miller and Lou Barnes played very well. They hook up for this touchdown early. It was 7-7 in the first quarter and Rich Brooks liked that one. Tony Cherry played a big role rushing for 143 yards on 34 carries including a two-yard touchdown in the second quarter that tied the score 14-all. Perhaps the prettiest play of the game. Miller rolls left, makes a super throw on the run. Barnes makes the catch and puts on a terrific move at the 15. 42-yard TD, it's 21-14. Barnes, eight catches on the night. Much of the pregame hype centered around Cougar running back Reuben Mays, but it was Cherry who was the running star. He picks up a dozen yards here in the third quarter, breaking a couple of tackles along the way. James Harper scores from the two. The Ducks lead it here, 35 to 28. Then came what turned out to be a key point in the ball game. The Cougars were punting, and watch Oregon's Cliff Hicks tries to field the punt, but misses it, and then accidentally kicks the ball. Washington State recovered in great field position. Looked like they'd score a touchdown, but the Oregon defense turned into a brick wall, stopping Mays and holding the Cougs to a field goal. From there, the Ducks went on to score again. Miller to Bobby to Bishop. Miller threw three touchdown passes on the night. The Ducks go on to win a big contest last night, 42 to 39, and Rich Brooks was happy. To the bootleg around the right side, and he waited. Uh, Miller is an outstanding athlete, and, and I'd like to take credit for coaching him on some of those things, but you don't coach some of the things that he's able to do. He's got great vision, he's got good speed, and, and great reflexes, and he can make plays that, that you really don't coach. Uh, what we've tried to do is get everybody else to understand that he's going to do that once in a while, so if they see him running around, get loose, get somewhere, he can get him the ball. Terrific game. Martina Navratilova shooting for a third straight U.S. Open tennis championship, and so far she's walking over whoever gets in her way. Navratilova in top form this afternoon against Italy's Sandra Caccini. Martina needed just 37 minutes to pound her way through the little Italian. Navratilova won in straight sets, losing one game along the way. The final scores were 6 love, 6 1. Martina now in the fourth round. In the men's play, Beatrice Gerolaitis had a few problems with the referee. He hit a serve out. His opponent, Yannick Noah, hit a winner. However, the umpire changed his call after Noah conceded the point. 
He's conceding. But well, why should he concede it? That's not the rule. He is. I don't know. I don't know. Just because you're a bonehead and you can't see a ball a foot outside the line. <laughs> After that, I guess the ump wasn't too disappointed that Noah went on to win the match. The Frenchman displayed some great moves in beating Gerolatis. Watch this one here. A diving shot and then the dance. The scores were 6-3, 6-4, 6-3. Other winners at Flushing Meadows today, Jimmy Connors, Yvonne Lendl, Stefan Edberg, and Jay Berger, an amateur. Berger ranks 730 in the world, upset Brian Teacher. Hooray for him. Race car driver Bill Elliott will be called the Million Dollar Man after today. Elliott won the Southern 500 today in Darlington, South Carolina. With the victory, he picks up a $1 million bonus for winning three of the four majors on the NASCAR circuit. Meanwhile, there's stock car racing out at Portland Speedway this afternoon. And some of the Portland's top NASCAR competitors racing for the $1,000 first prize in the 300-lap factory stock car Enduro. The race got underway late, and the last word, they still had a few laps to go out there. Golfer Joey Sindelar used a hole-in-one today to win the BC Open in Endicott, New York. He holds out the 212-yard 14th on his way to a 368. Mike Reed finished second one shot behind. He bogeyed the 14th hole. In the U.S. Amateur Golf Championship in Montclair, New Jersey, USC Sam Randolph defeated Peter Persons, won up for the title, and here he sinks a six-footer on the last hole to win the title. That's it. Okay, we have one more sports story when we come back. Sort of a sports story, sort of a story. Anyway, they came from far and wide to compete in the ninth annual watermelon launch. The only question is, why? If you happen to be out near Hillsboro this afternoon and saw what you thought looked like flying watermelons, don't worry, you're not going crazy. But there were plenty of people who did go a little bit crazy as they helped kick off the ninth annual watermelon launch. That's right, folks. Five-pound watermelons were launched skyward using rockets, propellers, hey, you name it. The man who launched all this madness, well, he's John Hancock. You can tell he's the guy wearing the horns. Do they look like they just paid taxes or they just did something like had a hernia or something? No, they're having a good time. Well, most of the folks who showed up to watch the launch are friends of Hancock's. They say they come back every year to see just how far he'll go in the name of fun fun with fruit. That's our news. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back at 11 o'clock. Till then, have a pleasant evening.